There was only one truly great poetic genius in his time, Christopher Marlowe, who in his thirtieth year, May 1593, was threatened by execution, following slanderous accusations of treason and heresy against him by the English Crown and Church. A feigned death has a life-saving operation, staged in Deptford, with the help of Marlowe's employer, the powerful senior adviser of Queen Elizabeth, William Cecil, Lord Burley, saw him banished for his own safety, at the price of a permanent loss of identity and name. Cecil allowed Marlowe to escape into internal banishment and exile, writing behind a curtain of multiple pen names or pseudonyms. Consider, however, that from early years on, Marlowe wrote under pseudonyms and by no means neither only after his feigned death, nor only under the name of Shakespeare. His multiple pseudonymities explain most of the paradoxes of the multiplicity of Shakespeare authorship candidates, many of them simply inventions of names, or borrowed names of living or deceased persons like Shakespeare from Stratford. Early after Marlowe's final disappearance from the scene, in 1593, the rumour went around that he died of the plague. Marlowe was, at that time, the most famous poet and the dramatic superstar of the London theatre. A poet and dramatist Shakespeare did not yet exist. The alleged first historical evidence of Marlowe's demise can be derived from a pamphlet, September 1593 of a distinguished writer, Gabriel Harvey, entitled A new letter of notable contents, in particular from the strange sonnet, entitled Gorgon, or the Wonderful Year. Separately announced on the title page. There we learn, that the wonderful year happened in 1593, Marlowe's alleged year of death. A. Gorgon, a popular monster image in Greek mythology, is equated here by Gabriel with a wonderful year, that is the year, full of wonders. B. Wonders, that, enhance their power in odd numbers. The fatal monster year of years is 93. C. Weep, pals, thy tambourine vouchsafes to die. Meaning, the literary man, Marlowe, granted his demise. The term pals refers to St. Paul's Churchyard, the London book market and hub of London's literary life, it wept for his life catastrophe. The sonnet contains a gloss, which points precisely, first, to the tragic event and cause of Marlowe's disappearance, second, to a satiric obituary, on Marlowe's mighty self-confident, and overconfident character, third, to Marlowe's dangerous scoffing religious convictions. Some details of point one, two and three. First, we learn that Marlowe died of the plague. He and the plague contended for the game. That plague themselves, for faint hearts plague themselves, that the grand disease disdained his toad conceit, and smiling at his tambourine contempt. Second, we get a fantastic insight into the positive and negative character traits of the true Shakespeare, Marlowe. Of the highest mind, that ever haunted pals. Of sky surmounting breath. Of a breath that taught the timpani to swell. Of a haughty man who extols his hideous thoughts. He sequidri rang out his larum bell. He had gurned at many doleful knell. 
who gloriously insults upon poor seals. Domineering in coward's lane. Disdained his toad conceit. His wondrous self. Like Juno's gaudy bird. He proudly stares on glittering fan of his triumphant tail. Like the ugly bug that scorned to die. He mounts a glory rear in a towering wit. This personal characterization of the poet genius is probably the most authentic and most plausible possibility, to imagine lively the universal genius of the true Shakespeare, which was light years ahead of its time, and inevitably had to incur the envy of mediocrity. Third. We are informed by the now well-known charge of Marlowe, as an atheistic scoffer. He, that not feared God, nor dreaded devil, nor aught admired. Or like that ugly bug, that scorned to die. Can anybody doubt, that this gloss, only month after Marlowe's final disappearance in September 1593, represent an early literary contemporary source of Marlowe's alleged demise? London superstar of the theatre, and dramatist of Tamburn. For Gabriel Harvey. Seemingly had died of the plague. Consider. The fact, that Marlowe did not die of the plague, but due to an obscure killing, became known only four years later, by the book. The Theatre of God's Judgment, in 1597. This book, originally from a French author John de Chassagnon, was translated in 1597, out of French, and augmented by more than 300 examples, that is heavily remodeled by a certain Thomas Beard, giving no credit to the name of the French author. Who was this unknown translator Thomas Beard? Be aware, nothing you read about Thomas Beard in encyclopedias today, can be regarded as assured reliable knowledge. It is not even known, when, and where Thomas Beard was born. Countless questions have so far remained unanswered, to name a few. What may be the meaning of the title emblem? Is it by chance, that the identical emblem in 1584 in England decorated the book with the Italian text, Ediscusi, by Machiavelli? And that the inlay banner of the emblem contained the phrase, Il vostro maligna e non giovanola? That is, your malignity avails nothing. Note. Machiavellian characters became characteristic of Marlowe's plays. Machiavelli's ideas are of undeniable influence on Marlowe. They are deeply interwoven with Marlowe's plays. I recommend to read the prologue of Marlowe's play, The Jew of Malta. Be aware. Thomas Beard's Chapter 25, entitled of Epicures and Atheists. In 1597 represents. After Gabriel Harvey. The second literary historical source, addressing Marlowe's grotesque murder, that is his presumed self-killing in the streets of London. Read and reflect a short excerpt on Beard's historical document in, Chapter 25 about the circumstances of Marlowe's demise. Not inferior to any of the former in atheism and impiety, and equal to all in manner of punishment, was one of our own nation, of fresh and late memory, called Marlin, by profession a scholar, brought up from his youth in the University of Cambridge, but by practice a playmaker, and a poet of scurrility, who by giving too large a swing to his own wit, and suffering his lust to have the full reins, fell. It so fell out, 
that in London streets as he purposed to stab one whom he ought to grudge unto with his dagger. The other party perceiving so avoided the stroke, that with all catching hold of his rest, he stabbed his own dagger into his own head, in such sort, that notwithstanding all the means of surgery that could be wrought, he shortly after died thereof. Or that they, referring to all atheists, might, in like manner, come to destruction, and so that abominable sin, which so flourishes amongst men of greatest name, might either be quite extinguished and tooted out, or at least smothered and kept under. That it durst not show its head any more in the world's eye. The author seemingly glosses over a double story of Marlowe's demise. A. On the one side, his official, impossible, cause of death. Inventing the virtually impossible of Marlowe's stabbing his own dagger in his own head, and. B. On the other side his true cause of destruction, inventing the extinction amongst men of greatest name, that is loss of identity and name. Smothered and kept under, that it does not show its head any more in the world's eye. This early allegorical complementary double account, A and B, of Marlowe's disappearance, can have been known and disclosed only by the author himself. This, and other plausible arguments support the assumption, that Thomas Beard may, must, have belonged to the pseudonyms of Marlowe. Consider Thomas Beard's moral and anti-religious contemporary views, in his writings and bestseller, inevitably leads to numerous questions and conjectures. To name a few. Where Thomas Beard got his, faked, knowledge from Marlowe's type of self-killing, of his career and deeper personality traits and so on? Why the location of Marlowe's murder in the London streets was erased in the second edition in 1612, but reappeared in Beard's abbreviated book, The Thunderbolts of God's Wrath, in 1618? Where did Thomas Beard get his immense historical universal world knowledge from? Where did Thomas Beard learn to master the ability to write high-level poems, such as on the pages 57 to 59? Can anybody really believe, that Thomas Beard, a presumed unknown clergyman from Huntington, has composed this high-level poem of seventy-eight lines? Listen at first only to the beginning four lines of the poem. Along the verdant fields all richly dyed with nature's paintments, and with flora's pride whose goodly bounds are lively crystal streams, begirt with boas to keep back Phoebus beams. Can anybody explain, why Beard is beginning his poem with these four lines, we find, slightly modified again in the anonymous play, The Maid's Metamorphosis. A few years later in 1600? And also, what the contextual meaning of seven lines of the next page may be. Listen. All proud attempts, that men of might do make. Or that he will abandon unto death his own, dear bought with exchange of his breath. Nor must we think that, though they die, they perish. Death dies in them, and they, in death, reflourish. And this life's loss, a better life renews. Which after death eternally ensues. Do not these lines clearly represent an impressive poetical blueprint of Marlowe's destiny, that is of a second life? All attempts he will abandon unto death. His own bought with exchange of breath. Do not think, though he dies he perishes. Death dies in him. He and death reflourish, his life's loss, a better life renews, which after death ensues.
Note. The third historical source of Marlowe's killing from France's Mears in Pallades Tamia a year later in 1598 clearly corresponds to a copy from Beard's The Theatre of God's Judgments, 1597. Thus, we have in reality only one, dubious, source of Marlowe's strange killing, from Thomas Beard.